Hello and welcome. My name's Ben Judah and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Sarah Chase, the author most recently of On Corruption in America, her new book which we'll be discussing right now. Thank you so much for joining me, Sarah. Thanks for having me, Ben. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you and I thought we'd begin at the beginning, really. I'd really like to know from you, how did you come to realise the centrality of corruption to international relations and to American politics? Uh, well, first it was international relations um, and everyone's politics. And I discovered that in downtown Kandahar, Afghanistan, where I lived for about a decade, uh, starting right after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And, and what I found to my amazement by about 2005, let's say, is that my neighbors were becoming more and more I want to say tempted back into the arms of the Taliban, not so much by any highfalutin issues of ideological, religious, you know, or cultural anything, but rather by absolute indignation at the um, abusive corruption of their government and what they perceived as the United States role in, in facilitating and enabling it. Um, and then I looked at a bunch of other countries from, you know, the Arab Spring countries to Honduras, to Nigeria, to Nepal, you name it, and found very similar things operating, that, that systemic corruption was um, really at the root of a lot of the international crises that, that are besetting the globe. And wrote a book about that that came out in 2015. And even in that book, I said, hey, guys, this ain't just them. We, meaning the United States and much of the West, are on this spectrum. And we had better be careful because it's been leading to dramatic um, upheavals in developing countries and we could be in for a similar thing here at home. I would say that I underestimated um, the speed at which those upheavals would become visible. How did the Trump era affect your analysis, especially of the United States and the relationship of these flows of corruption around the world to American politics? Um, to my dismay, I found that the patterns that I had spent about a decade exploring and isolating overseas were almost identical in the United States. And I would say the Trump era has brought them absolutely to the surface in a kind of barefaced way that Americans have not witnessed in something like a century. However, what I quickly discovered was two distressing facts. One is that those patterns have been building, especially since about 1980 in the contemporary period. And most significantly, that it has not, they have not been isolated um, to the Republican Party or the Trumpian wing of the Republican Party. That in fact, the networks that I have discovered operating and bending and repurposing instruments of state to serve them instead of serving the people, that those networks cross the very same identity divides that separate and pit the victims of corruption against each other. When did you take the decision to write on corruption in America? And what's the key argument in the book? And why does it speak to the Trump era? Um, it really hit me just before, I mean, I would say, your suggestion is accurate that the Trump election made it clear to me that that was what I had to do. I mean, I had been working on international corruption for, you know, the previous, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years. And my next target was Ethiopia. Well, after the 2016 election in the United States, it didn't seem to me that I needed to go all the way across the planet to find the next corruption story. It was happening right at my feet. I was living in Washington, DC. It didn't make sense to me as an American citizen to continue you know, exploring the workings of corruption overseas. 
Um, that said, another really important turning point for me was the Supreme Court decision in McDonnell versus the United States, which came down in the summer of 2016, before the election. And what distressed me the most about that decision, which overturned two unanimous convictions of the former governor of Virginia for corruption, was the fact that it was unanimous. And that told me that there was a gigantic divide between how elites in America across the political spectrum were understanding corruption and how ordinary people were. And so that brings me to your, the second part of the question, which is what is the main point of the book? And the main point of on corruption in America is that corruption here as elsewhere is not, I mean, corruption that matters, is not to be understood as the single venal action of an isolated government official who puts his or her fingers in the cookie jar or who executes a narrowly you know, inscribed transaction, quid pro quo transaction with some venal business person. Corruption in the United States that, that counts is not you know, the individual action by a, a single venal official who puts his and her, who puts his or her fingers in the cookie jar. Um, rather, it's to be understood as a kind of operating system of really sophisticated networks. And these networks span, as I said before, political parties, but also sectors of activity. And so where, you know, you hear the expression revolving door, that also implies that a single person, right, is pushing a door between government office and some company that, you know, the official used to regulate. But rather, what you have is networks that strategically place their members for a time in public office and for a time, you know, they then get to cash in in the private sector. And often, out and out criminals are parts of these networks or violent thugs. It's what I've seen around the world and frankly I'm seeing it here too. And, and so in that sense, corruption doesn't operate so much by, you know, one official putting something in their pocket. The quid pro quo may be indirect. It may happen way later. Um, because what you're doing is serving a network that in turn serves you before and after. So that's um, a major thing. Another point is that, you know, while corruption has always existed, this type of systemic corruption ebbs and flows, and we're in a flow. And so in Corruption in America, I select a couple of specific periods in history, including, you know, going back to the origin of money. And there's some really interesting concepts, even out of mythology, out of the Midas story, which, you know, seems to be about a greedy guy, you know, who when a god offered him a gift, he said, you know, uh, let everything I touch turn to gold. Well, he quickly discovered that was a curse, because everything of irreplaceable value that he put his hands on turned to metal. You know, well, we're in a period when people are kind of, there's a pandemic of the Midas disease and you put people who are sick with the Midas disease in charge of society and you get a lot of devastation. Um, another really important period was the Gilded Age. And the reason I touch on that uh, in On Corruption in America is not only to note the parallels with today's situation, but also to really look at, okay, how did we get out of it then? And that's a scary story because there was a lot of really creative, persistent, courageous resistance to systemic corruption, business concentration, um, business and political leaders being in bed together, uh, violence against people who resisted, reduction in democratic rights, reduction in civil rights. There was a lot of resistance to all of that and none of it really took. 
until the late 1930s it began taking and much more so after World War II. So I'm like, okay, what got us out of it? And the scary thing is it seems to have taken massive global calamities, meaning two world wars, which entailed two genocides, mass starvation in Europe and the use of the nuclear bomb, a pandemic that dwarfs the size of this one, and you know a global economic meltdown and so the urgency of what i'm trying to say in this book is not just that corruption isn't only you know a technocratic affair of bankers and 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 accountants it's not even just to say that corruption threatens democracy i'm saying last time we were in this fix it took you know four or five global calamities to get us out of it and so can we join together with the urgency that's required to curb it before it brings on this century's version of those calamities how important is the role of offshore finance in these networks that you've uncovered and in the contemporary Midas curse operating in America? Very significant, um, very significant in that uh, the offshore network, again, if you will, of facilitators who also are making out on the Midas curse and have it to some extent, um, they make it all possible. So, so many of the practices that are, um, you know, standard for global kleptocratic networks are largely possible due to the ability of the constellation of offshore jurisdictions for both shielding money and shielding the, I want to say, uh, entities that are used to uh, steal the money, loot the money. Um, but what I would say is I consider that those offshore networks largely to be the facilitating class um, and not so much the perpetrators of the kleptocracy themselves. They're sort of necessary handmaidens, if you will. What's wrong with the contemporary conversation on corruption amongst liberals or even on the left? How are we misdiagnosing the problem? I think there's a tendency now um, to find corruption on the other side of the identity divides. Typically politically, also nationally, what I've found quite interesting is that the focus on offshore and on, let's say, the banking sector as facilitators of corruption is finally uh, due largely to you know, your work and the work of others in this field, um, is finally at last beginning to penetrate um, and beginning to be, let's say, barely an acceptable topic of conversation in polite company, right? What is still not acceptable is to say that the actual kleptocrats are located here in the West as well. And even liberals, uh, I think, often fail to make that distinction, unless those kleptocrats happen to be Republicans or members of the Conservative Party uh, or whatever. It's much easier still for us to imagine that the kleptocrats are these rather colorful figures uh, located in rather colorful places like Kazakhstan or Angola or even Moscow or Beijing, but to locate the actual kleptocrats in London or Washington or New York remains a little bit uncomfortable. I also find that there is a tendency among uh, left-leaning um, folks to assume that disadvantaged portions of our population, such as people of color or women, uh, by the fact of their having been discriminated against, makes them immune to being members of the kleptocratic uh, class or kleptocratic networks. That's untrue. 
and it's it's a dangerous fallacy and so what i really think is missing is a good hard look in the mirror at how members of our identity group be it race be it gender or be it political party are part of this ecosystem and in particular what i point out in on corruption in america is while i'm not engaging in false equivalency and that there is no question that people on the right side of the political spectrum or conservative or libertarian side of the political spectrum have been more implicated in the very active campaign to dismantle um, laws and regulations that have protected the or had protected the country from the worst excesses of Gilded Age style kleptocracy. Um, this, the role that people on the left side of the political spectrum have played have played is as validators. So while, for example, there was an intense political conflict between, say, Republicans and the Democrats of the Bill Clinton administration, intense, I mean, to the point of impeachment, what you see when you scratch the surface is that Clinton era policies, frankly, validated much of the Reagan revolution. And so what might have been isolated as Reagan radicalism and dismantled after him, once Clinton stamped it with the Democratic Party seal of approval, it became bipartisan orthodoxy. And that is an incredibly valuable service that the American Democratic Party has provided to kleptocratic networks the world over. Thank you so much for your kind comment about my work earlier. And I'm conscious we're running out of time, so I've got one last and in its own way huge question for you, which is, what should be done at home and abroad? Because on the surface, a lot has been done over the last 20 years. FATF was established in 1989. UNCAC was uh, brought in uh, in almost all countries around the world under the aegis of the UN in 2005. The United States, if you look at the numbers superficially, has been pulling its, its uh, punches in terms of anti-money laundering prosecutions of major banks. What's gone wrong? Why is the problem so out of control? And what do we need to do to fix it? Um, and thanks for reminding me, US and around the world, because the other really important point about these networks is their transnational nature. They tend to be anchored in different countries' capitals, but they are very much transnational. And that points to severe limitations in some of the law, law enforcement uh, capabilities because of national boundaries. So I think uh, further reforms are possible, for example, allowing countries that, let's say, are part of, of a, um, you know, a different type of treaty regime, but why not al allow investigators from different countries to enter the territory of signatory nations and conduct investigations under the host country laws, obviously, like you can't bring your own search and seizure laws over into another country. You, you operate under their search and seizure laws, but obviously, you know, an investigator or a prosecutor in a United States jurisdiction is not going to be as interested, you know, in pursuing an Angolan inquiry or a UK inquiry as they are a US inquiry just because of the political, you know, um, positive impact for them of doing local cases. So those are some things. I mean, I actually think there's a lot that ordinary people can do. And I do have a bit of a grab bag uh, in the epilogue to on corruption in America, partly because I think that sometimes when a problem like this does seem so systemic and overwhelming, it can be extremely deflating for ordinary individuals. It's like, oh, the, all of these changes are things that have to happen on a level of legislation. And how can I impact that? Um, and are overwhelming in general because it just the problem seems so vast the good side of a vast problem is that it needs all of us we all have a role to play and the reason i made a bit of a grab bag is i think that we are all as human beings sort of motivated by what motivates us right what we feel our gifts are best applied to so sort of find something in that grab bag and do it but it has everything to you know it, it runs the gamut from 
choosing to take your money out of the big banks, which are, you know, multiple offenders again and violators of law, um, and putting them in a local community bank. You know, we can break up some of some of these big monopolies ourselves by simply taking our money elsewhere. Um, to what about things like um, nonpartisan ethics pledges on the on the level of no new taxes, uh, but with respect to some of these ethical and anti-corruption principles, very simple, uh, but where we get really serious about not voting for a for a candidate of either party who um, uh, who doesn't sign up to these types of pledges, including no big money uh, in their political campaign. Um, and then uh, back to law enforcement on national as well as international levels, in the United States and elsewhere around the world, we're into a let's reimagine the police um, phase, which is great. I think it's really important. Unfortunately, um, that general movement has come under the rubric of defund the police. Uh, I actually think that a lot of police need refunding, and that's the police whose efforts are focused on corporate crime and corruption. They need more resources, not less. They need more personnel, more stature, uh, as do the prosecutors who work on this type of cases. Sarah Chase, thank you so much for joining me here today, and thank you especially for writing such a path-breaking, profound, and fiercely moral book about the United States. Uh, to anyone tuning in today, I really urge you to buy uh, Sarah's uh, book, and more importantly, to read it very quickly before the election. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Ben, and thank you for your unbelievable work in this field. It's going to take all of us. Thank you very much. That's very kind.